peace of the Lord to all viewers around the world, um, all who are hearing my voice here this morning, in this arena and wherever you are sitting. I greet everyone in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We give glory to God. Our Father Almighty, for this fourth day of this impactful global crusade and for the minister's conference this morning. To minister to us this morning again, it is my singular honor and privilege to invite to the podium this morning the convener of the global crusade with Kumuyi, the General Superintendent of Deeper Life Christian Ministry, the Minister to the Ministers, the Messenger who is bearing, proclaiming the, what the Bible is saying to the Ministers. It is my pleasure to invite Pastor, Doctor, WF Kumuye Thank you Let's Apostle. welcome you very much Thank you, God Thank bless you. Good morning everyone How am I today? Are you as good as me? The Lord put goodness in every life In Jesus name Now we come Understand this is Ministers Professionals Conference. Let me pick on the, you know, the professionals, the doctors. If doctors came together all alone by themselves and a speaker is to speak to them, the speaker will not be entertaining them. The, mini, the, the meeting together of professionals will not be for entertainment. It will not be for motivation. They'll delve into their practice and they will see what the standard is and where the standard is falling and they'll raise up the standard. If engineers met together, if teachers met together, they'll not be there for the speaker to motivate them and then make them jump and dance and all that. They'll be sober. They will be looking at what it is it in a profession we need to address and as we come together as ministers as workers in the church of the living god we're not going to entertain you is that all right with you and then we're not going to motivate you motivate somebody and then he's energized to go and do what he had been doing which wasn't bearing fruit motivation in a meeting like this is not the thing we're going to do we're going to get to the word of god i believe you have your bible and we're going to read the bible together you'll see it yourself where are we? Where should we be? And what's the power that will lead us to where we ought to be? And the Lord will edify every life today in Jesus' name. Raise up your hand as we pray, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we're here gathered for you. We're not here for, to entertain ourselves, to congratulate ourselves, what great things we have done. We have not done anything great. You are the great God and the mighty God and the wonderful God. Lord, we pray you will throw the such light of your word into every heart and every life today. And you lift us up to be at the level we ought to be for your glory and for the goodness of God and for the expansion of the church. In Jesus' name, Amen. lift off your people, empower your people, engage us, Lord, in profitable service in the kingdom of God. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And the professionals and the ministers of God say, Amen. 
God bless you. You can see that we're coming to uh, this session. I'm talking to you today on the crucial essentials of an excellent ministry. A ministry, the ministry of the preacher, the pastor, the ministry of the minister as of God. And to make it excellent. And then to know what are the essentials there, what are the crucial things there that I need to take on board that I will know this is essential. This is something I cannot do you without. I'm coming to Hebrews chapter 8 reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 will serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God, instructed of God, exhorted by God. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for sea. Moses says, he says the Lord, that thou make all things, how many things, according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Moses was instructed by God himself. I'll show you the pattern on the mount, the mount of transfiguration. I brought you up all those 40 days he saw no other person, only God. And God showed him 40 days and said, this is the pattern I want. This is the pattern I want. This is the pattern I want in building the tabernacle. And when the end of the 40 days came, the Lord said, see, Moses, everything I've shown you, that you make all things according to the pattern should to thee on the mount. Uh, don't we have preachers, pastors, evangelists, ministers that don't even walk by any pattern? What idea comes from their head, from their mind? They just go out and do whatever. Don't we have people in the ministry of the church? Don't we have singers in the ministry of the church? Don't we have workers in the ministry of the church? They don't go by any pattern. They don't go by any standard. Whatever occurs to them, whatever mood they have that morning, if they are happy, if they are sad, whatever may be the emotion of the moment, that's how they work. We need a pattern. God said, see, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 is not talking about Christ. We're talking about Moses, but now Christ has come to show us. He got a pattern from heaven. He got a model from heaven. But now I see obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. And now he's handed over the ministry to us. He's gone and he has said, I have all power in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach them all things whatsoever I commanded you. It's giving us a pattern. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 11. It says, and he gives some apostles, not everybody. You see, because we are not following pattern, something happens in our ministry, in our church, and the apostle there is uh, not leaving the seat for us. And we feel, I should be an apostle, and then we break off so that he is now a founder, he is a general overseer, he is an apostle. No, he the God of heaven, he, the head of the church, he gave some, not all, gave some apostles and some prophets. And some people like the ministry of the prophet. They like to point, they like to control our lives. And they like to say, look at me here, I'm a prophet. And I tell you, this is what you do, this is what you do. And some people accept that. For somebody to rule, control their lives by prophecy. Speak to my life. Why don't you go to the watch 
And the Lord will speak to your life. He gave some, not everybody, prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. But why? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, God in his own economy, he gave those people the gifts for a reason, for the perfecting of the saints. But hold on. How will an imperfect apostle, imperfect prophet, imperfect evangelist, imperfect pastor, imperfect teacher, perfect the saints? It's life is like turned upside down. It's marriage. It's family shattered, scattered. There's no control. And the children are here and there. And that life, what they say, just listen to him. He's apostle. Don't look at his life. Don't look at his, you know, behavior. Don't look at his dealing with money, my friend. How will somebody who is sinful get seen and saved? Somebody will say, backslider, did you hear that the prodigal son preached in the far country? Well, you're a backslider, you're not a preacher. Yeah, but you see, the way things are in the land, and the way things are in the church, everywhere, it's like, you know, everybody, apostle, everybody, prophet, everybody, evangelist, going to do the work of the ministry. You cannot do the work of the ministry in that condition because the work of the ministry is perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, if your language cannot edify one person, your wife, if your language cannot edify one person, your husband. If your language, if the speech of your mouth cannot edify the little circle in your family around you, how can you edify the body of Christ? We need to take all that into consideration that if you are going to be an edifier, a person that edifies, edifies the body of Christ, the edification charity begins at home. We have to look around. Am I edifying the people who are closest to me? Am I edifying the people? Am I charging them? Am I lifting them up? Am I empowering them? Am I encouraging them? The ministry is to edify the body of Christ. In verse 13, verse 13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. That's the faith that believes in God and that relies on God, that depends on God for everything. And if the preacher, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, the prophet, the apostle cannot even believe in God. He cannot trust in God for Every need of his life is always depending on this and depending on that. And if he even goes to the dark world to depend upon those people that they don't claim to be Christians, they say they are idol worshippers, and a pastor and a preacher will go to them. And the, the man there uh, doing something on the ground and giving you something to eat and giving you something to drink. He says, what do you want? You say, I'm a pastor before an idol worshiper. And I want my church to grow and do something for me. That man is not called of God. If you accept what I say, say amen. <laughs> he wants some. Juju, some voodoo, some things done so that his church will grow. And he gave him something. And he buries something there. It's not depending on the Father, on the Son, on the Holy Ghost. If he dies in that condition. The Bible says 
it will not get to heaven. It will go to hell. Because he did not depend on the power of the Lord. Give me power. I want to work miracles. The power comes from Christ. Comes from the Holy Spirit. If you want to be an evangelist, a dynamic evangelist, and you want to see souls saved, you want to see the sick healed, the secret is not in the hand of the idol worshiper that people go to and they want something. Whatever you get there, no matter how many people are healed by that kind of power, on the last day, Jesus said, they would say, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we, done, have we not done many wonderful works in your name? But I will say unto them, depart from me, ye that walk in iniquity, I never knew you. If we're going to serve the Lord, we'll come out straight, we'll come out open, and then we'll follow the pattern. Peter did not go to any kind of backyard power a power giver to be able to raise all that he raised and do all the miracles that he did. Paul the apostle did not go to any backyard power to do anything or everything he did. If you are like that, you have to do like they did in the Acts of the Apostles. You have to confess, you have to believe, and you have to burn all those things you had in the past because our God is enough. And Jesus is sufficient. And it says that all of us, the members, the ministers, were edifying them, were preaching to them, were enlightening them, were encouraging them until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, that the people will minister to, that our, that our, our members will minister to, and the people we evangelize, that they will not remain babes or children, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the sledge of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Verse 15, in verse 15, but speaking, speaking the truth, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him. In all things, the purpose of the ministry, the essential of the ministry, it that we so teach and we so preach that the people who listen to us will grow up. They will not be toddlers and children and infants, ignorant of the doctrines of the Bible and ignorant of the possibilities in Christ all their life. They grow up into him in all things, which is the hedge, even Christ. We're looking at three points in the message this morning. And we're looking at number one, the perfect priest with excellent ministry for all men. He is a model. He is a pattern. He is our goal. He is the one we're looking at. He did it and we can do it too. The perfect priest with excellent ministry for all men. Number two, the promised prophet with essential message and mandate. Christ had been prophesied that he will come and he came to do what had been told of him that he will come to do. And in due time, at the appropriate time, he came and he came with essential message. He never said anything redundant, anything unnecessary, anything that we don't need to hear. He had all knowledge, knowledge of heaven, knowledge of angels, knowledge of men, knowledge of the earth, knowledge of history, knowledge of the present, and knowledge of prophecy. But he didn't give all that knowledge. He gave us the essential message, and he gave us the essential mandate. Number three, the precious promises for every member and 
minister. We'll come to number one. Number one, we're looking at the perfect priest with excellent ministry for all men. The perfect priest. We're talking about Christ. In Hebrews chapter 5, reading from verse 4, No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. Look at verse 5. It says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. He didn't just jump into that. Father, what should I do? Go be the high priest. And because of that, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son. Today have I begotten thee. We're looking at chapter 5, chapter, uh, this same chapter 5, verse 9. Look at verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Please underline the words obey him. I've been traveling around and I find there are people who think they are saved when they're living in disobedience. I found people who think they're born again and they're living in a diametrical opposite thing to what Christ has said. They live in all kinds of sins, all kinds of evil, and they do all kinds of, you know, gymnastics, and they still claim to be members of the body of Christ, and they claim to be ministers in the kingdom of God. Understand, he, because of what he suffered, he provided, he's become the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Then in verse 10, in verse 10, called of God and high priest, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We divide this to three parts. Look at number one. Number one is the excellent ministry of our high priest. Number two is the exalted minister in the heavenly places. And number three is our expected ministry as the holy priesthood. Look at number one. Number one, the excellent ministry of our high priest, our high priest. What's his ministry? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, so also Christ, chapter 7, reading from verse 25, it says, wherefore he, Christ, he, the Savior, he, our Lord, he, the high priest, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. We don't come unto God by an angel. We don't come unto God by the founder of our denomination. We don't come unto God on the basis of our title. This is who I am. And then I come to the presence of God and say, God, I'm talking to you. And they don't mention Jesus. They don't go through Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the only door by which we can get to the Father, by which we can get to heaven. He tells us wherefore he, our Christ, our Savior, our Lord, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Seen make intercession for them. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, for such an high priest Christ became us who is holy, that's Christ, harmless, that's Christ, harmless, that's Christ, you know, in some of the churches and assemblies and fellowships, we uh, fear some people. And it's because of what they say. They say here, if you don't do everything I say, and you are quoting Bible to me, you are quoting Bible to me, you look like you've gone to deeper life. Bible, Bible. If you don't do what I tell you to do, and I place a curse on you, Nobody 
in your country. Nobody in any country can get you from there. Now, Christ is not like that. Those who hurt other people, harm other people, curse other people, injure other people, and they pursue them with a kind of power that will destroy their lives, that's not Christ. Look at Christ. Because he is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's our Savior. I will be like him. you be like him in Jesus' name. Look at number two there. Number two there is the exalted minister in the heavenly places. Exalted. Look at Hebrews chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 now. Of the things which we have spoken this is the sum. This is the summary. And this is the logical conclusion. We have such an high priest. And he sat on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. He tells us in verse 6, he says, but now as he obtained a more excellent ministry, a more excellent ministry. Now, if you are going to follow up a pattern and you pick Moses, excellent, not the more excellent ministry. Aaron, Excellent, not the more excellent. David, excellent, not the most excellent, not the more excellent. But he, Christ, above angels, above men, above religious people of any generation, any dispensation. Now, he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is. Not that he was, not that he will be in the future, in the millennium, even to this present time, he is the mediator of a better covenant. There are many covenants in the, in the Bible, Abrahamic covenant, this one is a better covenant, Noahic covenant, this one is a better covenant, Mosaic covenant, this one is a better covenant, covenant, this one is a better covenant. A covenant with the children of Israel. But this one, a better covenant. He now, he has obtained a more excellent ministry. And is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. We're looking at, uh, at Ephesians chapter 1, looking at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Look at that. We come by conversion, by salvation, by regeneration, by the renewal of our very nature, and it leads us up in heavenly places spiritually heavenly places as we remain and abide in the heavenly places in Christ then all the spiritual blessings come but if we degrade ourselves and we go to earthly places earthly dungeons earthly valleys earthly powers then you stop the flow of the spiritual blessings in your life. But he, our God, through Christ, he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Abide there. Stay with him there, united with Christ. Look at chapter 2 of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm looking at verse 6. He has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ 
Jesus. If your seat is absent and you are not sitting together with Christ, learning of Christ, beholding the beauty and the glory of Christ, satisfied in the presence of Christ, your seat is vacant. Where is he? Where is he? It's gone to some backyard power giver. It's not there. Then you're not going to have the ministry it calls us to have. But you remain, you abide, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ. You don't debate your tradition. You don't debate your idolatry. You don't debate your any other thing. Not even psychology. Not the philosophy of men. You abide and remain there and you see together with him in heavenly places untold unnumbered blessings will be yours even this morning in jesus name we're coming to number three number three is the expected ministry as the holy priesthood expected ministry uh, i was appointed a teacher in school to teach them uh, a particular subject and they were they put me in the class preparing for the WAIC exam and they had an expectation of me another teacher had been there before but now they said they wanted me now it's not just praise the Lord I'm a teacher praise the Lord I'm teaching the final classes they had expectation you're a medical doctor and he gives you a license to practice. And it's not just, I'm a doctor, I have license to practice. The Medical National Association, they have an expectation. And the, and the patients that come, the people that are brought there for you to handle, they have expectation. Heaven has expectation. He put us in the ministry. Whatever the title and whatever the position, there is the expected ministry of the Holy Priesthood. And to start with, our name, our title, and our description as the Holy Priesthood. Look at First Peter chapter 2, and I read from verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, dignified, royal, kingly, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Look at that. Look at the description of the people. And we who are called into the ministry, and we who are members of the body of Christ, there is an expectation, and it's in that, in that verse, chosen generation. There are people who are not chosen. Why? Because they have not responded to the call, call to repentance, call to righteousness, and call to regeneration. Because they have not responded, they are not chosen. It says many are called, but few are chosen. Now we're part of that chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a priesthood that is dignified and uh, honored, royal priesthood that is kingly and the behavior, the action, the disposition and the appearance anywhere they can tell is different. When you see a doctor, he dresses like a doctor. He is different. She is different. And when you see four men, they are constructing the road. As you go, nobody needs to point and say that the four men, what their appearance and what they control and what they're standing firm, you can tell that the four men, that's the engineer there, that's the construction person. You can see him there as he talks. It's, not, it's looking at the pattern. It's looking at the drawing. And he's doing everything. Everything you can tell and ministers, people should be able to tell in your comportment, in your conduct, in your life, in your character. They should be able to tell royal priesthood and holy nation. You know, somebody is preaching and he said, hey, let, look at me and listen to me. I don't believe in holiness. You are not part of that holy nation. If you are part of that holy nation, you will not be contradicting your 
call, you'll not be contradicting the call of Christ upon yourself. It says you're supposed to be a holy nation and you come to tell the public and you come to tell the world that you're not holy and that you don't believe in holiness. You know why they say that? Because, uh, you know, there are some ladies in the congregation there and they've been messing up together and they want to declare openly, lady, don't judge me, I'm still a preacher, I'm still a pastor, I'm still a leader. I don't believe in holiness. If you don't quit in that condition, you'll be kind of expelled on the final day. It's called us to be a holy nation, a peculiar people that he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I pray that this expectation will be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. Look at Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 28. We're looking at verse 18. It says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Amen. Amen. Christ, the Father, honored him. Christ, the Father, exalted him. Christ, the Father, positioned him to be higher than the highest in the whole universe. Because now he has given him all power, all authority in heaven and in earth. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, go ye therefore. Therefore, because you are with me, I'm with you. And because all power is given unto me, and because no power on earth can bring you down as you stay in the place I put you. Go ye therefore and teach how many nations? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, teaching them to observe all things. Remember, in all nations, to every creature, everyone will preach you. Everyone will evangelize. Everyone will teach. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Do you know there are preachers who change the message from city to city? Ah, you can preach that in Lagos, but not in many city. Nothing like that. You can preach that in Nigeria, but not in Sierra Leone. Nothing like that. You can preach that in Africa, but not in America. Nothing like that. Teaching them, all the nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And if you do that, and lo, I am with you, how often? Always. Always. You know why some people don't preach everything? They know the Lord has taught us in the Bible. When they go to those places, this is on familiar ground. I've never met these people before. And I don't know the people that hold the power and the authority. I don't know what they will do unto me. They don't believe that the Lord of all power, all authority is with them everywhere they go. Anywhere they go, they are searching. Who are the people, the decision makers here? Who are the people, the power holders here? Who are the people, the king makers here? That if I know them, then I will have freedom. Once they give me the liberty and the license, the liberty and the license that Christ has given them is not enough. He has given us liberty. He has given us license. Amen. 
And he says, with that liberty and with that license, is the one that called us. It's the one that is going to judge our ministry on the final day. We don't have to be main pleasers. You know, bow here, bow there, until our back is bent, and we cannot lift up our backs anymore. Because Christ is with us, and he is for us, and he has commanded us, and this is what he expects, and this is what he will judge on the final day, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And everybody shout, Amen. Amen. We're coming to point uh, number two now. Number two, the promised prophet with essential message and mandate. The promised uh, prophet, that's Christ. He was promised. And then we're told he has the essential message and the essential mandate. We'll divide this to three parts. Number one, the prophecy and the decree concerning Christ. Number two, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Number three, the preaching of the declarations of Christ. Let's look at number one. Number one, the prophecy and decree concerning Christ. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, Reading from verse 18, it says, And I will raise them up a prophet, capital P, from among their brethren, like unto thee, Moses, and will put my words in his mouth. God said, I will put my words in his mouth. Moses, you're like the primary school teacher. And you are beginning the spiritual education of the children of Israel. And everything I've told you, everything I put in your mouth and you declare is at this preliminary level. Now, the higher one, the greater one, the holier one, the, the heavenly one is coming. And when he comes, I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. He's talking about Christ. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which I shall speak in my name, I will require each of him. How do we know that he's talking about Christ? Look at Acts chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 22. And for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, unto me Moses, him shall ye hear in all things. He'll talk about repentance here. He'll talk about restitution here. He'll talk about being born again, regeneration, hear him. He'll talk about righteous life, except righteousness be a greater than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. He'll talk about purity of heart. He'll talk about sanctification. Hear ye him. He'll talk about marriage, one man, one wife, until death do us part. I'll put my word in his mouth. Hear him. He'll talk of the harvest. He'll talk of evangelism. Hear ye him. He'll talk about healing. And he will pronounce the healing upon the people. Hear ye him. He'll talk about deliverance. He shall cast out devil. Hear ye him. The totality of everything 
that he brought. He was talking about his coming again. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in me, ye believe in God also. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He's coming. All that he said, we're not picking and choosing. He prophesied, shall the Lord your God resolve unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, it tells us unto you, first God, I've been raised up his son, Jesus. He now identified that prophet to come. I've been raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. Uh, we're looking at uh, number two here. Number two, we're looking at the principles of the doctrines of Christ. He has called us. And he says, I am going, but I put you in place as my ambassadors. And what I should have been preaching, go preach. What I should have been doing, go do. What I should have been emphasizing, if I were here on the earth, go. And emphasize that anywhere, everywhere you go. And it's giving us the principles of the doctrine of of Christ. It says in chapter 6 of Hebrews, reading from verse 1, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, <laughs> what does that mean? Don't preach that again. Don't say that again. It says, like a builder, we've laid the foundation. Now, leaving the, um, leaving the foundation, let's build the walls, let's put all the structures, and let's go to the roof. We cannot be on the foundation every time. We're building a sanctuary. We're building a house. We build the walls and we build the roof. We build everything in uh, living. The principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on uh, unto perfection unto perfection. That's, that's what the word says. Not laying again the foundation. Now what are the principles of the doctrine of Christ? Number one, repentance from dead works. What are dead works? The works of a dead man. Dead in sins and trespasses. It's not born again yet. It's not come to life in Christ. And it's dead. All the works he does. He might, you know, give money. He might even preach. He might even pray. He might go to, you know, whatever area and say, hey, I'm delivering people. All the activities, all the actions, all the works, all the efforts of a dead man, they are dead works. And he says, we should repent from that. That is the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. And then he says, he, he tells us, and of faith towards God. That's at the foundation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Only believe, fear not, only believe. And that daughter, that son, that person will be healed. The faith is the foundation. Look at verse 2. It tells us in verse 2, it says, And of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, water baptism, and then Holy Ghost baptism, and baptism in persecution and suffering, or baptism, because he wants you to bear your cross and follow him. He wants you to deny yourself and follow him. And whatever the suffering, whatever the persecution, he says, you are baptized in that baptism that I am baptized with the doctrine of water baptism, spirit baptism, and baptism in persecution. And then he says, of laying on of hands. That's not the climax of ministry. That's not the peak of ministry. It's the regular foundation of the doctrine of Christ. And of the resurrection of the dead. That Christ will come. And the dead will be raised incorruptible. And that also there will be the rapture. That when he comes, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be made alive. 
in the twinkling of an eye. In a moment, as if you are blinking your eye, the trumpet will sound. And then the dead will Christ, and we who remain alive shall be caught up together with them. The rapture, the resurrection is part of the doctrine of Christ and, the, and of eternal judgment. There will be the white gray throne judgment. Some will go to the lake of fire. Those who are not born again, although they are claiming to be born again, those whose lives do not reflect the new birth, the salvation, the regeneration, the change of life, all those people whose names are not found, reaching, kept in the book of life, they go to the lake of fire, but the people who are born again, the people who are living the righteous life, the people who are pure in heart, for they shall see God, then they'll go finally to heaven and, we, and be with him forever and ever and ever. Yeah. You'll be there in Jesus' name. It's not talk of mouth, repentance. It's not talk of mouth, restitution. You know what? When I became a Christian and I heard about restitution, there was one thought that always was in my heart. I don't want to do anything that I have to make restitution for, and then I'll find it difficult to make the restitution. You know, challenges will come, trials will come, and situations will come that will make me, the pastor is not here, and my, the members of the church, my friends are not here. I could have done this, but if I do that, eventually, I'll have to make restitution, and I don't want that. I don't want to make, you know, this because of the shame it will bring, and therefore, I restrain myself in the spirit of God and by the grace of God that whatever I will not be willing or able to make restitution for, I will not do. You know, when you live by the principle of the doctrine of Christ, it keeps you straight. It keeps you firm. And it makes your life upright. Your life will be upright. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're looking at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, According to the grace of God. Everything is by the grace of God. Salvation by the grace of God. Sanctification by by the grace of God, spirit baptism, by the grace of God, service, by the grace of God, according to the grace, which was the grace of God, which was given to me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Have you laid the foundation? The foundation of Christ, our Savior, Christ, our healer, Christ, our sanctifier, Christ, a baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Christ, the coming King. We laid the foundation. If you are fearful, go for more grace. If you are fidgeting, go for more grace. If you are looking at the faces of people and you fear the frowns of men. And because of that, you cannot declare the totality of the word of God. Go for grace. All those who have done it before us, they had grace according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. That's Paul the Apostle. He said, I've laid the foundation. But you know some people after laying the foundation, they're not in charge anymore. They're not in control anymore. They say, well, others are, they are building on the foundation. We have established the foundation of salvation, of sanctification, of the essential, crucial doctrines of the Bible. Whatever they build on is between them and God. Actually, the man is afraid. He's afraid to confront them. My friend, what are you building on the foundation? 
Are you building another kind of doctrine? First, they cannot say that. They fear people. That's why, because of the fear, they say it's between them and God. Whatever they're doing, I have done my part. Paul, the apostle, said, yes, I've done my part. I laid the foundation, but I examined Titus. What are you doing there? Timothy, what are you doing there? Silas, what are you doing there? And he said, let every man, let every minister take heed how he builds buildeth thereupon. In verse 11, it says, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And verse 12, verse 12 now, if any man builds upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious tools, wood, he is trouble. In verse 13, it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest. Whatever we do, it's not just the action, it's the intention, it's the attitude. If the disposition we have, are you angry and therefore you say what you say? Are you frustrated and then you say what you say? Are you offended and you're trying to revenge on somebody and you say what you say? It's not just the action. If the disposition of heart, the attitude of the heart, it says, for every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try, the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is. I pray when that reckoning day comes, your work will stand. Amen. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the preaching of the declarations of Christ. The preaching of the declarations of Christ. Here, we need to watch. Uh, because there are many preachers. In fact, the more wrong they are, the more bold they are. You see, I'm going to tell you this now. You see, take it, put it on record. This one is not in the Bible, but I, prophet so and so, I, preacher so and so, I, apostle so and so, I say, they put themselves at par with Christ. Not only that, above Christ. And they put down and they demolish, and they destroy, and they scatter everything Christ has said. And they put themselves at the final authority. On the day of judgment, you will discover that you cannot be the final authority. And your authority will authorize heaven to kick you out. Because you know, anybody that exalts himself above Christ the Savior. Look at the price the Savior paid. And look at everything he sacrificed. And now he gave us this. And he says, this is what to declare. All the declarations of Christ. And then you come on. You have not been nailed on the cross. You have not said, Father, Father, my God. God, why have you forsaken me? You have not cried, I thirst. You have not suffered anything, anything to the intensity, uh, the, le the literal or the least uh, suffering of Christ. You have not done that. And now you put yourself, where were you born? Where did you see the Bible? Where did you meet Christ? And now you put yourself above Christ and you tell members of the church and you put them under your bondage and you say, I say, well, everyone forgets about you, we forget about you. Give me a good amen. amen. And Jesus came after resurrection and Jesus came the stone was rolled away and Jesus came and we have an empty tomb there now. Here is the risen Christ and he spake unto them saying all power 
is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, as we come and go along in ministry, me, for example, 30 years ago when the for life was started, many of the people I know now, I didn't know them. I just came and taught the Bible study. There was no personality. There was no individual, man or woman, that I would see the face. They were all my students, and they were all the people that came to learn from me. But now years have come and gone. Fifty years have come and gone. And I know many people now that I didn't know 50 years ago, but Christ is still Number one in my life. And there's no new person I know. There's no new authority I know that I will see. And because he's there, I cannot talk. Hold on. I didn't know him a few years ago. And so if he comes there, he's not going to replace Christ. And then I'll say, that lady is there. If I talk about worldliness and I talk about dressing like the world and looking like the world and having the attire of a harlot, that lady will be offended. I didn't know her 10 years ago. That doesn't matter to me. I look at Christ. The Christ was appointed and the Christ was anointed and the Christ was enlisted and he says, go and teach all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And that's what we should do. Everything. Look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20. It says, teaching them to observe all things, teaching them to obey all things, teaching them to do all things, teaching them to pray and have the grace to perform all things, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And the people of God say another amen. amen. The Lord will be with you. Amen. You will not draw back. Amen. You will do and say and preach everything Christ has commanded. Hold on, hold on. Look, look up here. It says, and they went forth preaching the word. The Lord confirming the word was signs following. You remember that? That's Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Hold on now. If I go out, I know what Christ has said I should preach to sinners. What Christ has said I should preach to those who are sick. But then I see some people there and I say, Lord, you have to excuse me today. Because of that man, because of that woman, I cannot say that now. They'll be offended. And this is not my state. And if anything happens, I am here by myself. And so, I deviate from the preaching of Christ. The Lord is not going to confirm the word you preach out of fear. The Lord is not going to confirm what you are saying because you're unbelieving and you cannot preach the word of Christ. What he will confirm is his word. So if you want heaven's confirmation, you will say, you will preach, you will declare just what he had given that will declare. And he will be with you every time, everywhere. Unto the end of the world. Amen. Another amen. amen. If you believe that, that's exactly what you will do. You know, I wonder, Daniel, in Babylon, he would only say and do what the Heavenly Father 
wanted him to do. They said, Daniel, that's a lion's den. And you will get there if you don't do what the committee, what they have decided. And you keep on praying unto the God of heaven, lions, who made lions, who made you. God will not allow what he made to destroy what he made. They said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, <laughs> your thoughts, this is like where you are coming from. This is Babylon. That is idol, and that is what we worship here. If you will not bow, if you will not bend, if you say, I'm a man of conviction, a man of courage, and this is where I stand. Uh -huh, you stand. But Nebuchadnezzar does not go by that principle or purpose. Like, uh, this is now the, uh, what's it now? The furnace of fire. And he said, King, we're not careful. We're not worried. We're not bothered to answer you in this matter. Go ahead. Go ahead and do what you want to do. Our God, whom we serve, will deliver us from the furnace of fire. What? Nobody ever faced Nebuchadnezzar to talk to him face to face like that before. He was angry. And in anger, he said they should bind those people. And he called the heftiest, strongest men in his kingdom. Cast them there. I'll teach them a lesson. Nebuchadnezzar, heaven will teach you a lesson. And he threw them there. And then all the courts... Of Babylon that bound them, everything was burnt. Everything of Babylon burnt away from your life. And they stood up and they were walking in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar had never seen anything like that before. Miracle is going to happen to you that your enemies had never seen before. And then the son of God. The compassionate high priest. He came from heaven. Think about the distance from heaven to earth. He came and he was walking with them. They saw him. I will see him. In my trial, I will see him. In the furnace, I will see him. When the greatest of men, when they come against you and they say, because of com your conviction, here is what you will do. You will not see them, you will see the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, he was still a kind of fuming and rejoicing in his authority. He says, I have the fire, I have the fury, and I have the purpose. If I want to cast anybody into the fire, there, there, let me go and look at their ashes. Your enemy will never see your ashes. And he looked inside there and said, what? These people are doing what nobody had ever done. First of all, they are standing, you will stand. They are walking, you will walk. And then he said, friends come, counselors come, senators come. Did we not cast three men into the fire? They said, yes, O king. He said, I see four men. One, that shed that's a big thing. Three, look at that. And then he says, but I see a fourth man. It's the son of God. He came from heaven. And they were walking in, in the fire. If you want to see the presence of Christ and the companionship of Christ, every time, walk through the fire. The fire that the world is building. And they say, this will stop him. When you hear that information, 
don't stay at home, don't lock your door, get up. I, I didn't even want to go there before. Now that I hear that Nebuchadnezzar is raising up a furnace of fire, I, I like to go and repeat history. I like to go and have that miracle again. I get up and I get there and Christ will be your companion. And he said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the living God. Ah, you know them now. You know who they are. You know their title now. Servants of the most high God. The living God come forth. And he said, was well, sorry, uh, you know, we have to cut our fellowship for the fourth man that came, and he went to heaven, and he came forth, and he examined them. And he didn't see any mark, any sign of the fire on them. The fire of heaven is in your soul, it's in your body. It's of the world, will never have any place, any hold in your life, in Jesus' name. Can I tell you something? After that experience, nobody on earth threatened Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with fire anymore. Once you pass through, once you overcome, they thought you will crush, you'll be crushed, you'll cling, you'll cringe, you'll collapse because of the threats of the fire. But once you overcome that, that's the secret. Nobody will threaten you with that fire anymore in Jesus' name. Only once, only once you overcome, go through, go through, go through. And then uh, once you graduate from that class of uh, fretful people, worried people, anxious people, what am I going to do? What, uh, get up. Get through that class. And once you go through that class, you'll not come back to that class again. We have to do, we have to declare everything he has called upon to declare, to called us to declare. And he says, even unto the end of the world, he'll be with you in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at the precious promises for every member and every minister. We're looking at this under three subtitles. Number one, the exceeding great and precious promises. Number two, the extensive, gracious, and peculiar promises. Number three, the expedient, glorious, and performable promises. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the exceedingly great and precious promises. We're looking at Second Peter chapter one, verse three. Second Peter chapter one. We're reading from verse three. According as his divine power has given unto us all things. How many things? How many things are we given? How many things do you have? All things. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and unto godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. He has called you to glory. Glory you will have. Your family, glory. Or the evangelistic field, glory. In the church ministry, glory. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. How do we live a you know, low level life when we have exceedingly great and precious promises? How do we live fearful lives, ordinary lives, human lives? How do we live impotent lives when he has given unto us great and precious promises for life, for family, for ministry, for profession, for outside job, for an inside job? He has given us great and precious 
promises. How do we live a life that people cannot see? We even have ordinary promises. Not to talk of extraordinary promises. Many people are not living according to the privilege and the promises the Lord has given them. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises, these great promises, these precious promises, ye may be partakers of the divine nature. What nature do you have? What nature do you have? Now, look at the sheep. The sheep has his nature. Look at the lion. The lion has his nature. That's why the sheep, the lion, they don't act the same way. They don't fear the same thing. They don't tremble for the same thing. The sheep, that's his nature. It trembles. A little thunder there is shaking. Rain is shaking. And another animal comes, animal like yourself, and is shaking and trembling because the sheep. But look at the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He shakes for no one. He trembles for no one. He frets for nothing. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he has his nature. And now he has given you to be a partaker of that divine nature. Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. Well, the nature of the king, the nature of the Lord, and the nature of the lion of the tribe of Judah. What do you fear? How are you fearing? You can't come out. You hear something in the news you are preaching. You can't come out. Somebody you heard. The threats of somebody. They give a sign that we are here. And we are coming. Let them come. You are now having the nature of the lion of the tribe of Judah. You will overcome. You have overcome. Before the test already, the Lord has marked you that you are okay. Yeah. I am okay. okay. I am all right. I am a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror. He gives us the exceedingly great and precious promises. And we have the divine nature. Happiness escaped. The corruption that is in the world through loss. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the extensive, gracious, peculiar promises. Extensive, extensive, extensive. It's not the promises you had. Many years ago when you were saved, there is more. Not the promises you had. Many years ago, you were sanctified. There is more. Not the promises you had. When you were baptized in the Holy Ghost, there is more. Not the promises you had. When you began the ministry, there is more. As the trials and the temptations and the difficulties, as they grow higher, you have greater promises. And those promises are sufficient for every one of us in Jesus' name. Look at Romans chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 20. Romans chapter 4. We're looking at verse 20. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He staggered not. You look at the promises of God in the Bible. And it, it, it's staggering. It's great. Unbelievable. And yet like Abraham. You stagger not at the promise of God through unbelief. What he has said he will do, he will do in your life. Amen. He will do in your ministry. Amen. And you're not stuck. Yes, I see that promise there. When you go through fire, you'll not be burnt. And when you go through the flood, you'll not be drowned. He said, because I am with you to uphold you every time. You don't say, yes, I understand. But something is a fiery more than the fire there. There's no other fire I will go through. I said you will go through. Yeah. You are not a consumable material. Yeah. You are a constant material. 
and the fire of this world will not burn this conqueror made from heaven in Jesus name. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but he was strong in faith giving glory to God. Verse 21 in verse 21 and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform every promise that Lord has given you from today he is able also to perform yeah. barren miracle children are coming yeah. fruitless abundant fruit coming yeah. weak strength yeah. is coming yeah. blind I don't even mean only uh, just physical blindness the Lord will open your eyes yeah. See success in front of you. Yeah. Am I talking to somebody there today? Success in front of me. Yeah. In front of me. Yeah. In front of me. Yeah. He is able also to perform. Yeah. I rejoice with you. Performance in your life in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three is the expedient, glorious, performable promises. Performable promises. The performable promises are the promises God had made. And he made to this generation. The generation of believers. The generation of ministers. The generation of true members of the body of Christ. And the Lord said he's going to perform in your life, he will do it in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 35. It says, cast not away therefore your confidence. Here now, you have confidence. Do you have confidence? That God will do what he said he will do? Do you have confidence that no fire can burn you up? Do you have confidence that everything you lay your hand on, you will, uh, you will have and receive in Jesus' name? Uh -huh. When you go out of the meeting, you don't cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. When you go out there on the field, when you go out there on the road, when you go out there to the people you saw before, and they always shout you down, and they always look you down, and they always terrify you by their words, by their look, then uh, the confidence you had here, <laughs> you see, I don't know whether I have confidence now. You have, you have, you have. You are the one casting it away. I will not cast away my confidence. Anywhere I go, I will not cast away my confidence. Uh, you, you know, sometimes uh, I'm telling you my secret is all right. I said, is that all right? Because you can take the walking stick of the old man and use that walking stick and you'll go farther in Jesus' name. I came to Edo State many, many years ago in the 70s and the early 80s. And when I came, you know, we traveled with, you know, some of the men of God and women of God all around. But the confidence I had at that time, you know, we got to that village, was to witness a particular family. And the woman was, you've heard the story before, act as if you never heard, and so that it can be new. So I have the joy of telling the story as, okay, they have all heard about you. They are not excited. Act as if you never heard. And then we got to that village, and I saw that woman running around the port. And the, you know, the uh, sister Beatrice, I think, said, let, let's tell, let's tell uh, this woman that uh, there's no God there and there's no part. I said, hold on, let her finish. And then she finished. I said, woman, what are you doing? And she said, I'm worshiping my God. I said, your God, look at this God that you said, and look at your child paralyzed. If you will abandon that God that is no God 
I will pray for your child and the child will get up. Now, we have not even prayed that the confidence I had at that time. And uh, so the woman said, no, what if I throw away my God and the prayer and you pray and there is nothing. The confidence I had at that time when I mentioned the name of Jesus, something good must happen. And eventually, after back and forth, back and forth, I said, woman, listen to me, I'm a teacher. And my students don't determine my curriculum, what I teach. I tell you, be my student today. Cast away that pot. And she picked up the pot, empty. And she smashed it on the ground. And his God, her God was broken. And I stood where I stood. I didn't have to go and shake the child. It's the word. It's the power in the word. And I said, boy, I think I was about six years of age, paralyzed from birth. I said, get up and walk. I didn't go there. I didn't even lay hands on him. Why? Speak the word only. And my servant shall be healed. That's the confidence I had at that time. Until this day, I carry on that confidence. I do not cast away my confidence in the Lord, and it has always worked. I said, it has always worked. That confidence you have, that name you have, that power you have, Hold on to it every time. And the Lord will affirm and confirm the word in Jesus' name. In Taraba State, the Taraba people are listening now. Because this is global. We went for a crusade, a citywide crusade, not GCK at that time. And we finished that night. And I was uh, coming to the car and there were three people one on a march the one the other one on the march and the other one in the wheelchair three of them and as they were there were coming out and the security personnel around me said we're well, sorry pastor we need to clear these people we didn't know when they got there i said what's that he said paralyzed people just by the place, by the car. As you are entering to the car, you see them just like that. Well, let's clear them before you. I said, why are you clearing them? They want something, they'll get what they want. And so I got to the car and I said, I didn't touch them. I said, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, rise up and walk. And then I entered into the car and we drove up. Before we got outside the compound, before we got to the gate, I heard shouting. The first one got up. The second one got up. The third one got up. That's the confidence I had at that time. And I tell you, today, much water has gone under the bridge. Much testings have come. Much, many challenges have come. But I did not cast away my confidence. And I'm telling you, from today, as you move on, as you go on, as you minister, the power that you receive here now, because I'm going to pronounce power upon your life. The power you have now will bring confidence. Amen. Heavenly confidence. Amen. Dynamic confidence. Amen. Everywhere you go, power will be manifested through you. Amen. And you will not cast away your confidence. Amen. Your father in the Lord retains his confidence. And is having the recompense of reward, sons and daughters, you'll not cast away your confidence. 
What God has raised me up to do, you will do. Yeah. What God is enabling me to do, you will do. Yeah. Hold on to that confidence. Yeah. I see conquerors before me. Yeah. I see achievers before me. Yeah. I see people who will manifest the confidence of the name of Jesus before me in Jesus name rise up and claim it rise up and claim it rise up and claim it you will not cast off your confidence He is your high priest. He forgives. He cleanses. He sanctifies. He empowers. Remain. Abide. In the heavenly places in Christ. You have a new nature, a new life. He has lifted you up. To search with him. And he has given you confidence that whatsoever you ask, in the name of Jesus will be granted. Cast not away your confidence of faith. Believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 